today um, to hear uh, Nathan Alexander's talk, Mind the Gap, Research, Policy, and Praxis in Mathematics Education. Um, many of us know who Nathan is. For those that don't, he's a PhD candidate in mathematics and education here at Teachers College. Um, his dissertation is a quantitative study employing structural equation modeling techniques. Um, and examines interracial differences and measures of students' algebraic proficiency based on their mathematics self-efficacy. I am excited to know what that means. <laughs> and um, Nathan is a very esteemed friend and colleague um, and mentor to a lot of us, um, not just in uni, but throughout the, throughout the campus. He's been um, an extraordinary leader and an extraordinary um, scholar. So we're really excited to have him share his brilliant work with us today. So, there you go. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thanks for having me. I wanted to start by uh, thanking Kathy, Veronica, Dr. Morell, everyone at UMI for uh, inviting me to, the talk, to give a talk today. Uh, this is actually a perfect time to talk about my work because I'm attempting to finish school um, at some point in the foreseeable future. Um, Today's talk, um, I'm going to just kind of dip in and out of my research. Um, it's going to be about 35 minutes. It's going to really be split into three primary parts. We're going to start with the first part, 10 minutes there, uh, which is really going to be this whole mind the gap. What do I mean by that? That second piece is going to really deal with uh, research policy and practice in math education. Um, I'm going to really talk about what the current state of research is in math education regarding black youth and how I'm criticizing a lot of that and what I think we can do to really ensure that we're producing quantitatively literate citizens, and specifically black children. The third piece is really getting at this concept of new models and new outcomes. So I'm saying there's an issue, but what is my response? Really, what am I saying we can do? And what's the vision that I'm trying to establish for us to move forward? Here's a bit of uh, the talk, the agenda kind of laid out in a little bit more detailed manner. You can see, I'll revisit this slide as we go through the talk, okay? You'll see a lot of these pictures here that I'm going to put through the talk. Uh, I want you to engage with them, and I want us to come back after the talk from the Q&A, for those that are still around, um, and talk about the messages that we send when we see things like this. This one right here says the black-white achievement gap. Why closing it is the greatest civil rights issue of our time. So a few comments before we begin. So we're really going to dig really, really deep into the literature review of my dissertation. Uh, I think this is a perfect opportunity, given that I'm here at UMI, uh, to talk about a lot of the critical reading and research that I've, I've, I've looked at from past scholars and how I've integrated that into my study. And it's a work in progress. So what I want you to do, please, is push back, ask questions, challenge me, um, provide actionable feedback when you can. It's a lot of it's a, really useful for me at this period. And feel free to email me um, any comments or questions that you have. And my email on the board there. And lastly, um, I'm borrowing a quote from uh, Danny Mark. He's at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And he says, taking a pro-black pro child stance is not necessarily, it shouldn't be viewed as taking a stance against any other child of different race or ethnicity. And I want us to just keep that in mind as I talk critically about race and ethnicity. And a few definitions. So I'm going to talk about the achievement gap and the working definition of that I got from Ed Week, disparities in academic performance between groups of students. When we talk about racialization and racialized discourses, uh, in 1988, uh, Miles referred to racialization as processes or situations where race is introduced to define and give meaning, emphasis on defining and meaning to some particular population, their characteristics and actions. When I speak of quantitative literacy, I'm really talking about an aggregate of skills that are going to allow students to function in the world. We get a lot of messages about math today, right? Um, quantitative literacy really is important and in the context of me being a math educator. And so when I say that, I'm really talking not just about being able to do math, but about your habits, your, scout, your beliefs, the dispositions that you hold about math and numbers. And lastly, when I talk about practice, it's just practical applications. Are there any questions so far? No. All right, I'm going to put in, talk about this quote from Ivory Tulsa. Uh, he's at Howard University. He's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of New York Education. And he, for me, has been um, an important person in terms of his use of statistics in education. 
and really challenging how we look at statistics and use statistics. And he makes the comment, uh, do we, or asks the question, do we use statistics to shame, criticize, or pity black learners? <clears throat> or, do, or to strengthen, support, and empower them? So I want to think about that. I think us to think about that in the group today when we go through the talk. I have three primary goals today. Uh, the first is this whole mining gap. So I want to really take a look back from a historical perspective and explain how racialized, there's that word, right? Achievement gap analyses produce static, and what I'm calling debilitating notions of achievement. I want to present some alternatives. I want to outline some critical research approaches that dis help dispel notions that black students are bad at that. And lastly, I want to model success. I want to present an alternative, which is really my dissertation study, uh, to current methodologies by focusing on improving black students' quantitative literacy, learning and achievement. So we will begin with part one. Has anyone ever seen this photo before? Yeah? So this photo is from Peter Iron's book, um, The Broken Promise of the Brown Decision. Uh, in this book, he really talks about what Brown 1954 outline and where we were today. Um, this book came out about a decade ago. And when we go through the presentation today, I want to talk a little bit about how we see these images showing up in a lot of different frames. And I'm going to begin by jumping back in part one to 1903, 1933, um, when, we, when we look at Carter G. Woodson's work. He makes the, the quote, the present system under the control of whites trains a Negro to be white, and at the same time convinces him of the impropriety of the impossibility of his becoming white. When we think of that from the early century, early part of the 1900s, how that showed up, we're going to go through um, history here and basically come out today in 2013 and talk about what these same quotes and comments look like today in today's frame, right? And then we go to 1970, and we look at Freire, and he's saying, no pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates, emphasis here, and by presenting for their emulation models from among their oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in their struggle for redemption. I think in the context of teaching, pedagogy, um, moving our students forward, we can, we can gain a lot from here given the time period. You think about what was happening when this work came out, right? Then we jump up a little bit further to 1995 to Asa Hillier, who was in Georgia. Um, and he talks about what was happening after Brown and Board. And I want to just focus on the piece here. He says that new procedures were implemented that provided differential and inequitable treatment. And we see a lot of that in our work today, in our schools, uh, we see it in the research. Uh, we can look on the news. We can go into a school building and we see a lot of what Asa Hillier is talking about. And I want to also just kind of integrate that into that. And lastly, Danny Martin again. This is the, the quote that I'm really going to be using in terms of math education. And he says that in a field that increasingly purports to be committed to equity for all children, education he's talking about. It is reasonable to ask why there are no explicit discussions of the pervasive whiteness in math education, research, and policy context. And that's really the charge that I was given today for the, for the talk. And so what's the problem? I'm saying that the problem is that racialized achievement gap analyses are a continuation of these systems that were presented in those four comments. And I hope today to be able to talk about why I believe that to be true um, and some solutions that I think we can we can address some solutions that I think we can use to address and how to move forward. The first of these is make others aware of these problematic systems, which is what I hope to do today. Second is to provide alternative approaches that will generate success now. And I just got through speaking, actually, um, with another colleague, and we were talking about what it means to be quantitatively literate and how our students are going to be affected if they're not, you know, they're not quantitatively literate in the high school context. How will they perform with their SAT? You know, this, is, this is considered a, a gatekeeper, an interest exam to get them to higher education. Once they get to higher education, how do we keep them out of remedial math courses? So we have to think about quantitative literacy in the current context as we work to really change this larger system that we're functioning in. And lastly, this long-term vision. How do we dismantle oppression and improve social justice in education? 
So now in part two, uh, we're going to just talk about practices in math education and a lot of the stuff that's come as a result of my reading. Um, this quote here from Anderson, Metric and Fowler, it says, though the term achievement gap can be used in reference to multiple groups of students, most studies and reports of the achievement gap have focused on differences in achievement test scores between white and African American or black students. Now, my first question sitting in a lot of statistics classes is what about the Hispanic students, the Asian students, students of other racial and ethnic backgrounds, right? When we see this achievement gap in math, it's as if the two population, the two, the two groups, racial groups in the population are just black and white. They're constantly put against one another. And a lot of arguments have been put for by researchers, population statistics. 72% of the population is white, around 13% of the population is black. This is from the census in 2000, from a few years ago. But is that enough and enough reasoning for us to continue to create this dichotomy? And if so, what does it teach us? How does it tell us to improve the performance of our students? And so I approach this question from three different levels. Uh, a philosophical level, uh, a theoretical level, and a methodological level. I think these allowed me to really think about my dissertation study, given that I am using a large data set um, about the types of questions that I would form. And when I formed these questions, how I could ensure that I integrated a lot of that research that I showed in the work of those scholars from the early 1900s, and I was still being very connected to the context today in our schools and classrooms. At a very philosophical level, Cresswell, uh, he cites Mertens, who talks about this transformative view. Um, and it's one of the other views, it's kind of a response to the post-positivist view. And it says that social justice needs to be integrated into research and our methodologies and into the policy context when we're doing research. And that it should confront oppression very upfront. It should be there, it should be present. People should understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to go about it. And that's what I really tried to do in my dissertation study. From a theoretical lens, uh, I borrowed something from uh, sociology. Celius and Orsonman in a paper talk about the heterogeneous race model. And that when we talk about black-white analyses, right, we present race as these, this, this grouping or this tag that's just homogenous, as if all black people are alike or all white people are alike, right? And in that, they say that when we contrast these race, we forget about a lot of different things that really inform differences within a group. I think of the tag I talked about, intra-ethnic versus intra-ethnic differences, right? And the last piece is this methodology. Every research study, specifically a dissertation, has to have sound methods. And from a methodological frame, I'm borrowing from Tillman, uh, who's a qualitative researcher. Um, she talks about culturally sensitive research approaches, specifically from an African-American perspective. And in that paper, uh, it's the use of cultural knowledge. And in that use of cultural knowledge, you're talking about experiences. What is the experience of the average black student in a school today? What is the experience of the average white student in a school today? Are those good enough for us to compare? We look in the context of New York City, and we go up to 145th Street. What does that context look like when we go down to 76th Street, when we talk about classrooms? Yet still, we have a test coming from the department they're both taking it, and we're using those test scores to compare students in very different contexts on the ground. What does that really teach us? So when I integrated all three of these approaches uh, for my study, it really came out to what I'm looking at today. It's modeling success from within. What can we learn from our models of success, from the black youth that do exist, that do do well in mathematics? What are they doing that produces success? And I'm looking through some specific frames, um, and I'm going to talk about those in part three. Um, but before we talk about those, I want to talk about what modeling success really engages. So I think it requires understanding some background context. The first of those is in these messages that society sends to us on a day-to-day -day basis. We're students and ourselves, we have to ask, am I a math person? Have you asked yourself that before? Who can do math? Put this image there. This is from a um, magazine, Time. Time Magazine. And it says Asian American Wiz Kids. And when we think about kind of what we see in popular media and culture today, 
No, what, what messages are sent when we have our youth asking, who can do math, or am I a math person, right? The second piece of that is understanding how these identities connect to students' perceptions of their abilities. So you have to engage your identity, and then you have to say, well, am I a math person? Yes, no. If I think no, can I perform well? Is it good enough, right? There's these competitive frames. And lastly, it's investigating how perceptions, students' perception of their abilities, relate to actual gains in their proficiency. Did I do well? And can I do it again? Because in this context of the K-12 pipeline, students going from secondary education to post-secondary education, graduate school, wherever they may go after that, it's this idea of persistence, right? And really being able to continually ask yourself, did I do well? If you did not do well, can I do it again? Can I do better in the context of not having done better before? My dissertation really deals with this third piece. From my reading and research, I found that a lot of scholars, uh, specifically in math ed, are currently doing some really good work with those first two questions. They're asking the question about what messages are sent in popular media context today. My advisor, for instance, is running a class right now, or she's running a class on mathematics and culture, culture um, which really gives us this question of those messages. And in terms of the identities, we have a lot of math educators dealing with math identity and how it functions in the classroom context. My dissertation really gets at this last piece is, well, if you feel that you can do good at math, does it actually show up when you take an exam? Does that proficiency demonstrate itself in other contexts? So the broad question again is, do higher levels of math self-efficacy equate to demonstrable gains? And I put that in, in, in my dissertation specifically because when we think about demonstrable gains, our students have to go through this pipeline, right? So when you think about a lot of the testing and accountability, right? We have scholars talking about assessment, how we need to change assessment. But in their attempts and work, great work to change assessment, our students are still going to have to sit for an SAT exam come January, right? We need to be able to demonstrate this efficiency. The second piece is mathematics is a gatekeeper, a gateway. I'm a mathematician, I'm a math educator, I think math runs the world, right? <laughs> and when I think of it as this gatekeeper gateway, if a student can't, this is a research study, you know, the student doesn't really take algebra one, they say by ninth grade, there's, there's certain beliefs about what happens to that students in their life trajectory, right? That they won't necessarily be able to build a quantitative literacy to succeed in an advanced math course in college, right? What does that mean for a student being able to major in math? or STEM field when they get to college. Third piece is access to gifted and talented programs, post-secondary education, merit-based scholarships, STEM majors and careers. This is all affecting these demonstrable gains. And lastly, I think something that's just real on a day-to-day -day basis for all of us that we can all relate to, this is the ability to function in a society where math is perceived negatively. We gotta do our taxes, we need to understand it, right? got to finance yourself. There's a lot of data. This whole data analytics movement is happening right now, right? How can we be participators in this movement? We need our youth to be quantitatively literate. Now, we're going to go ahead and start shifting to, the, to my actual dissertation. And here's this term, self-efficacy. So Alba Bandura uh, is considered the, the father of self-efficacy, or now the grandfather of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy in a very general frame is the beliefs about our capabilities to produce a specific outcome. And it's strongly related to motivation, regulation, and cognition. So if you think about that last line I put up there, you know, if a student has a low self-efficacy, will they even be motivated to enter an advanced math course? If their cognitive space is in the sense that I can't do math, what does it feel like to take a test? When we go back to Claude Steele's work with stereotype threat and how that affects performance, and you can see that self-efficacy is really a window through which you can think about proficiency and quantitative literacy. An example, let's say Angela asks Dante, are you taking Ms. Woods' pre-calculus class? And Dante responds, no, I don't understand any of that mess. What does that really mean? I think we can say that Dante just doesn't want to take pre-calculus, right? But some messages have been sent. He's embodied a lot of messages that he's potentially received over the course of his schooling to say that I don't understand this stuff, I'm not going to take it. And when you think about yourself as a high school sophomore or junior, I mean, you're not really thinking about yourself at 30. 
for college, right? You're in this current space. Do I really need pre-calculus? And a lot of other researchers are dealing with students' perceptions about the need for advanced math. But in terms of self-efficacy, when students are asking these questions to their peers, we have to really consider what that means in terms of their ability to even sign up for a class. Mm -hmm. And how often have you responded in a similar way? So when we think about what informs variance, when you think about variance in a quantitative frame, it's basically just different differences, right? In mathematics self-efficacy. And we have three things here at the top, the academic peer network, school belonging, and school engagement. So in the context of schools, and I'm very interested in the school context because I think that quantitative work in large-scale data sets really provide us an opportunity to test hypotheses and come to some confirmation of those hypotheses, which will further inform our qualitative work in schools, right? And so when we think about it in the school context, these three factors have been strongly related to self-efficacy. Then we look at prime math achievement, gender and socioeconomic status. I separated these because these cannot change. They don't just change overnight, right? You know, I can't necessarily go and say, oh, you know, gender, you know, really informs this much variance in math self-efficacy. I can't change your gender, right? And so when we think about what this means, I think there's a different way that we need to approach those questions, right? These are things that, are, that we can really work with students in the classroom and context to really ensure that their school belonging engagement increases and that they're supported in these spaces. And when we approach questions, specifically in a quantitative framework, we have to rethink what those variables mean. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And a host of other factors, uh, which is one limitation of using large-scale data sets. You're limited to what the original researchers decided to study, right? Now, I was going to talk a little bit about Bob Moses. Um, I don't know if I have the time today, but I want to talk about Bob Moses' algebra project. I think what Bob Moses has done with the algebra project uh, is an attempt to what I'm trying to study in my dissertation. He's basically taking students who largely struggle in mathematics in high school, and he's made them a promise. You commit to this program, by the time that you get out of high school, you will be ready for college level math. And I think that's really what my dissertation is getting at, right? It's really rethinking Bob Moses' work from the context of self-efficacy, and really looking at, well, what does this space look like when you have someone working with students? When I'm not really concerned about how these students are performing in contrast to their white peers, but into the space that they're in right there. He's doing something, she's doing something. You know, what can they learn from one another? And how can we inform that to ensure that they reach their <coughs> college level proficiency by the time that they get to high school? And so the data that I'm using to answer these questions uh, is a new data set. It's the most recent data set provided by the National Institute for Education Statistics. It's called the High School Longitudinal Study. Uh, the first wave began in 2009, and the second wave just came out actually very ideally right this year as I finished my dissertation. So it worked out very well. Um, it's a two-stage stratified random sampling of ninth grade students who started high school in 2009. So we're looking at this national representation of students that are currently in high school right now. They're seniors at the current moment. The entire data set contains uh, 23,415 observations. I'm not using comparative methodologies, so I was able to drop every other student other than the black students, and my final sample is about 3,749 youth that I'm looking at. And the methods that I'm using to answer a lot of these questions is structural equation modeling. Um, there's three specific pieces of structural equation modeling that I'm using. Simultaneous equation models, latent barrier models, and nested models. And I'm going to talk about those and show you some of my models. So here's the full model with those variables that I presented on the slide before. So the question is, how do these things inform self-efficacy, and how does self-efficacy inform proficiency, right? So we have math proficiency here on the right. And in structural equation models, when we look at circles here in math self-efficacy, we consider that a latent variable. Now, I have other latent variables here, and I'm going to talk about those. This is the latent variable model. Latent variables are variables that we cannot measure. So you have a large scale data set, right? They ask students questions. We take each of those questions and say, hmm, these six questions look like they could really give me a measure of how students feel they belong in their school. And these five questions tell me how much students feel like they're engaged in school. 
And so we use that to create constructs which allow us to measure a lot of other things. And so with the latent variables that I'm using, I'm looking at school belonging. It has five underlying variables that are related at an alpha level of 0.65, which is fairly uh, good in consistency. And those uh, school belonging variables really get at whether students feel their perception of how students feel they fit into their school. The school engagement variable similarly has an alpha level of 0.62. It's informed by four variables. And it's basically how engaged are students in their school context. And the last is the academic peer networks, five, five variables, alpha level 0.76. And it really gets at the academic orientation of students' closest friends. And so when we think about that, think back to Angela and Dante earlier, right? Now what is that academic orientation between those two, two students look like? And I'm using wave one variables to inform wave two variables here on students' math self-efficacy, which is informed by five variables. And those variables are really focused on whether students feel that they can perform well in their current math class, whether they can do well with the textbook that's going to help them understand, whether they feel their teacher can get them to help them understand it. It's really measuring their self-efficacy, and I'm, of course, looking at that effect on math proficiency. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of statistics, so I'm going to just zoom up very high level to some preliminary findings. So in general, what I've found is that higher levels of math self-efficacy do equate to gains in math proficiency. So this is the question we asked, right? It worked out. However, this trend seems to plateau right at the proficiency levels that are math and algebra 2 courses are high. So we need to think about what's happening right around algebra 2 and trigonometry and pre-calculus, right? And at current, I'm able to think about what's required and what's not, right? A lot of high schools require that students go through algebra 1 or 2, but something's happening right there at uh, algebra 2 with students. And it begins to reverse when you go to the highest proficiency levels, right? And what that means is students at the very highest levels are actually reversing their proficiency as they go up. So student in calculus, for instance, may have lower self-efficacy. And I can make some claims about that preliminarily, right? Calculus can be considered a very difficult subject. They may have less friends. They may, their belongingness may go down in the class context. Whereas it affects their self-efficacy to think like, I really want to do this. I, I'm here. I could do algebra one. I could do algebra two. But as I proceed through this math pipeline, I'm, I'm getting tired. You know. So there are some preliminary thoughts I have there. Black males in general exhibit higher levels of math self-efficacy. I found this interesting because I did a pilot study when I first started here at TC, um, and I found that among black males there's this sense of competitiveness. They want to compete with each other, right? It's like, man, yeah, I can do this. I got this. But something happens. When I engage academic career network, school belonging, and school engagement, it switches. Females exhibit higher levels of that fantasy. And so I have to investigate that a little bit more and see what that really means. What happens when you really bring into these other variables? so that it switches. So there are many stories to tell, and I'm going to try to tell one now. So let's look at four hypothetical students. And I've created these students from lines in my data set. And so if we look at these four students, Angela, Brian, Candace, and Dante. Angela and Dante had a conversation earlier. You remember Dante said he didn't want to take the chapters, right? I take each variable, and I've tagged where the student falls in that variable. So we look at Angela, she's a female. I held socioeconomic status, everyone's at the mean, right? So we don't really have to talk about what that means in the context of the school, right? We're just going to put it, we're going to hold it at the mean. And the mean for SES is negative 0.18 for the black students here. And I look at prior math achievement on three different levels, above average, average, and below average in general. The academic peer network. When I think about these peer network variables, there was just three levels that I could also look at. Whether they were positively oriented, whether their peers wanted to go to college, whether their peers wanted to take math classes and things like that. Whether they were, and I put this in quotes, neutral. And then lastly, whether they were more negatively oriented, which means that the student may have a, a, a peer network that's not interested in a lot of the academic context, right? And I really want to focus on the academic peer network piece there. Then you have the school belonging and school engagement, which is high, moderate, and low, as well as their math stuff now this table is predicting the proficiency probability, which is basically saying, what's the likelihood that a student will be, prop will be proficient in algebraic expressions, which is the lowest of the levels measured in the data set? And what's the likelihood that the student will be proficient at the highest level, which is geometric sequences? 
sequences. For those that know math, that's right in the middle, the slam middle of calculus. And we think about algebraic expressions, you're thinking about the algebra, algebra one, okay? And here, systems of equations, it's right around end of algebra one, beginning of algebra two, where that shit happens, right? So I'm looking at these three levels, there's seven levels total. And when we look at these numbers here, they range from zero to one. They're probabilities, right? So you have a probability of one means that it's going to happen, a probability of zero means that it's likely not to happen. And when we look at Angela, who has high self-efficacy, which is informed, remember that model I showed, right? By high levels of engagement, belonging to a positively oriented academic career network. When I look at her predicted probability for algebra one, for instance, if I were to say that that's that tag, she has about a 0.9 probability to be proficient there. Which generally means that I give Angela a test that express that examines her uh, uh, literacy on algebraic expressions, there's about a 0.9 chance that she's going to do well and pass that exam. When I go to the highest level for Angela, for geometric sequences, which I can kind of tag right now as this higher level math concepts in college than that they would need to be for college, she has about a 0.11 chance of being proficient on that exam. And that really means passing the proficiency exam, and we can talk about it in a lot of different ways. And I'm speaking of proficiency as a, about one standard deviation above the average for the entire population in this data set, right? Now, if we shift over to Dante, who she was talking to about pre-calculus, and we look at Dante, who has a low max of efficacy here, right? Which is informed by low school engagement, low school belonging. He has a negatively oriented academic peer network. And his prior math achievement is below average. His probability levels, in comparison to Angela's levels, uh, for algebra 1, or this first level, algebraic expression is about 0.71. When I shift up to the highest of these levels, what happens? It's 0 0.00, right? Now, at this point, I'm able to say, what can this teach me? What can we learn from this? So I think we know that there's this heterogeneity, right? We're looking at black students here. There are differences. So I hope that I've made the argument that if I were to compare these students by race, what am I really, able, what am I able to learn, right? And it's critical evidence-based research. So we go back to that picture of Bob Moses with those students. I think that in school contexts, we find that after-school programs, schools, particularly in urban spaces and areas, we really see classrooms that look that way, right? And if we have Angela and Brian sitting there and I'm able to use this data, can I not think about, well, what's causing Dante's school engagement to be low? What about his school belongings? Who are his peers? <clears throat> Who's Angela with? So for a teacher or for a counselor or for someone else in this space, they can think about ways to address some of those issues that are informing his self-efficacy first, which are affecting his proficiency, right? Large-scale data. So I'm able to test the hypotheses here, right? I don't think this is the end of the road. I think what this dissertation study looks like for me after I finish, whenever I do finish, um, it's really finding some relationship with schools to see what this looks like in a classroom context. I think we can talk a lot about this on a very theoretical level with hypothetical situations, right? They really allow us to test hypotheses and confirm them which will really give us the means to go into schools and say, hey, I found this stuff in this very quantitative frame. I want to see how it functions in your school or your classroom. And another way is to model alternatives. So let's say someone asks me a question, well, why didn't you try this? I think in a quantitative frame, I'm able to quickly write up a, a code, run it, and see what happens, right? It's not as simple to do that in the classroom context. We can't really continue to interrupt. So when I'm able to test these hypotheses, I can really talk about them in a context-specific way when I go to the classrooms, really shift a lot of things at the higher level. And I've been talking a lot about qualitative research. I think my future research is really going to look at how self-efficacy functions in the classroom context. I mean, what factors contribute to advanced proficiency? I was limited by the high school longitudinal studies variables, right? There's a bunch of other things that I want to talk about, right? And I think I'm able to take these first few variables, really think about them critically, and then use it as a starting point, as a foundation to where I'm going to go in the future. And I think that's it. It's a study. I want to just thank again, Kathy, for she's here. Have a good day uh, for having me talk about my research. Um, and my dissertation chair, who couldn't be here today, and uh, Dr. Mensah, Felicia Mensah, who's on my committee. 
and the, the provost of TC, uh, Thomas James. Uh, he's been very uh, helpful in me thinking about my work and how I'm going to use it in the future. Um, and all of you for coming today, and that's it. Thank you. Not bad. What is your uh, I am who I am because of who we all are. It's an African proverb um, that's used when people thank each other. Um, just saying that a lot of this work couldn't have been done. Just a lot of the conversations I've had with many of you in this room. Uh, this is the end of about six years of reading stressful nights. Um, yeah, so that's that, that, that. basically says if you get this factor that someone else says, mm -hmm. Veronica may do a research study and say, I think this is a good measure of school belonging. I'm going to take my data set, confirm it, and see whether or not it fits with what her definition is, and I can make some changes there. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I took the high school longitudinal studies definition of what school belonging was. I ran mm -hmm. the model on the entire data set, which is the 23,000 students, and I ran it just on the black students. And then I said, I'm not sure that this is really getting that, and I ended up adding another variable, which is why I asked five variables here. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, I found that one of the other variables in school belonging really deals with how students answer this question that's related to what they do after school. It, 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 um, it loaded on the school belonging variable. Um, you know, I don't know what really that means in the terms of the school belonging for students, but it did show up. So I threw in a lot of these variables from the data set and I slowly chopped them off, and I came back to what they call school belonging plus one variable. With school engagement, uh, that's really what, and it has the lowest alpha value here for the black students. HSLS, that's what they said, and it really fit. Um, the alpha values were the same from the entire sample to the black sample, and based on the sample that they use, um, with this method that they call Monte Carlo simulations. Um, it was the same thing there, so I kept that. And math self-efficacy, it's a way too variable. Uh, it's a little bit difficult. I'm still building. This is the preliminary model here with this mass self efficacy. It's difficult because when Bandura, Albert Bandura talks about self efficacy, he says it needs to be domain specific, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm just troubled with this idea that I have this data set that they're providing me information, but there's these other things that I want to talk about. And so as I go through a lot of the variables in the data set, I'm thinking about does this really measure what I'm talking about in this study? Because we can throw any variable in there and say that it's not self-efficacy, right? But I think when we talk about self-efficacy and just make variable in general, we have to really think about, is this measuring what I want it to measure? I can ask you if you feel good at school, but is that really your perception of your school? Um, and does it really show up across different samples of students? You know? I hope that answers it. Yeah. I have a question that's going to reveal a little bit of my uneasiness with statistics, but what exactly does the alpha level mean here? That is something I'm not familiar with, but since I'll be having to do a quantitative study in the near future, I'd like to know what that means. So higher alpha, le alpha levels, uh, it's complex alpha, that's the statistic. <coughs> I've heard of that. Yes, yeah, so that's the, so the alpha, when I say alpha, I mean Kronbach's alpha, if you've taken the stats class, that's what it is. It basically gives us a measure of how strongly these measures are related. So 
if I get an alpha value of 0.2, it's basically saying they are not related. Okay. And then if you create a construct with that alpha value, you're really not measuring how these students responded. So imagine that I go back here, and these were questions, right? And I give you Angela, Brian, Candace, and Dante's answer. And then I say, oh, I want these four variables to measure self-efficacy, right? But then if I look at their responses to those variables, and they're all over the place, I get an alpha value of 0.2. It's saying your data set is not measuring self-efficacy for all these students that you're looking at. Okay. Now for a different sample of students, I could get a different alpha level, right? Because it's based on the student responses to those survey questions. Yeah, please ask me. This is good. <laughs> well, no, I was just, well, I have a comment on question. Comment is that like, I really appreciate this. Uh, I really appreciate this study for like, a lot of different reasons. I have a lot to say about it. But um, my question is, can you just talk a little bit more about the relationship between, um, between, I guess, this study in general um, and like the the post, you know, you know, calculus or other other higher levels of mathematics. You know, once a person leaves college, you know, what is the what's the relationship between all this that you know that you study? What's the relationship between their uh, I'm not getting the language right. You know, their, uh, uh, I don't know, quantitative literacy, the, the, uh, all of these things. I'm sorry, I really apologize, but what's the relationship between these things and like this post college? What happens after? Right, what happens after? Uh -huh. um, so, I'm thinking about high school and myself as a high school student, right? Um, I was the guy that was in calculus my junior year. Uh, my senior year, I was off campus. I was doing other math classes. I was a TA for my trig, a trig class, right? So I was, I was a student who had kind of mastered, I felt, in that context space, right, compared to my peers, like math for just lack of better words, right? I think what that means is I'm more likely to be able, which I did, I majored in math in college, right? But why this is important from the high school to the shift over, so what about like Dante, right? And I say that because Peers and achievement can be viewed in a lot of different ways, right? We can say that you take a test, you didn't do well, the student internalizes that, we put our beliefs on that, and those messages, I think, inform where that student can go. So the counselor may say, well, you didn't really do well in your classes. He may internalize, yeah, I didn't even like the class. I don't even like math. So after high school, you know, I might be a mentor to this student, right? really pushing them and say, well, why don't you go out of this space or this college? Why don't you think about these things? Let's say he chooses business. He has to take business statistics, right? Here's this phobia and fear of reliving itself. Let's say he takes a placement exam to get into college. So we think about like CUNY right now, right? And how many students are in remedial courses when they get to CUNY, right? It's because we're using these assessments, we're comparing students, and we're not really stepping back to think about how these messages are internalized and what that really means to these numbers, right? It's more than just numbers. We can take a failing math grade, say that a student can't do math, but how much of that failing math grade are those messages? This is assumption that when a student takes a math exam that they're actually, they're doing every question, and they're capable of doing every question, that they want to do every question, that when they woke up this morning, it was a good morning, that they're not thinking about something else happening today, that they had a good weekend, that they liked their classroom, their teacher, I think a lot of those are these identities. And when you internalize those identities in a math-specific context, it looks like self-efficacy. And I think that a lot of that informs how students' trajectory through math. And in society, it's just numbers and quantitative literacy, right? Raise your hand if you've ever said you don't like math. At some point. <laughs> <laughs> So and then when you say those things, it's like it's an everyday. Raise your hand if you said you can't read or you can't, you don't like, you don't. Will we, will we say this? Uh, in society, it's okay to say you can't do math, right? But if someone tells you they can't read, you go look at them with a like. <laughs> why are you saying in front of me? You're gonna you're gonna put some judgment there, right? My argument is why is that same judgment not attributed to mathematics? And it's just like, oh, I can't do math. That's that's for y'all. Who would say that about reading? And I think that's what shows up. Students don't think about math in the real world a lot. And we as educators have to do a lot to show them that 
in high school, math is really problem solving in a lot of different ways. Um, my department wouldn't necessarily think that problem solving is what we see in a lot of schools today. But for a college math major, having been one, and I have some of my classmates here, math is very different. It's proofs. It's really thinking about how it connects to the world, and what it means. And in high school, you're really given a list of problems to solve for X or Y, right? And if students internalize that as math, this is where these messages, I can't do that. I don't like that. I don't know systems of equations. But math is very, very broad and it's much more context specific. When you go to your taxes, and I do this because my mom, uh, she loves taxes. But then she'll tell me like, oh, I just don't know how you do it, baby. It's all this math. I'm like, you're doing the numbers. You're crunching numbers right now. It's just a different context, right? And I think that's what we need to move forward. It's saying numbers in math in high school don't show up the same way in, the, in life. Um, and shifting students from secondary to post-secondary, it's letting them know that, you know, you might not like it in this context, but who knows? When you get to high school, when you get to college, it may look very different. And you can almost determine how that looks for you, right? With the courses that you sign up. Did that answer? Uh, I, I think so. I want to hear, I want to hear more. Okay. Have more. I have a bit of a new course. Yes? I am, I'm not my major in English, but I, I'm still very fascinated by your research, so thank you. Um, thank you. I'm just curious about a couple of things. Um, one of them is, I'm wondering a lot about those students who, are, who struggle with the higher level math, and I'm wondering if any of that can be attributable to the ways that um, young people of color in ur young people of color in urban communities are actually instructed. Um, based on my observations, a lot of times math is is um, instructed in a very linear manner, as opposed to um, in more affluent communities, it's much more exploratory. And you might introduce algebraic concepts in like third or fourth grade, understanding that you know um, you're not going to be holding students accountable for um, those concepts, you know, on tests, but, you know, exposure is much greater, I think. Um, you know, people play uh, Beethoven for their babies and their tummies, right? You know, that, that kind of, that, that whole mentality that, that children of color, you know, they can't handle it yet. Um, and I wonder if that shows up later um, because students just haven't had exposure to these higher order um, concepts until it's too late. Um, I'm also wondering if, in your research, that you found that like conceptions of um, self-efficacy differed um, between races, like how it's even conceptualized. Like, do children of color think about self-efficacy different um, than children than white children, for instance? You know, I'm wondering, like, kind of problematizing it. Like, what is self-efficacy? Um, so I think at a theoretical level, it doesn't look different. I think at a measurement level it does. So when we think about like modeling, mm -hmm. um, there's this I can talk about. This slide here, right? Mm -hmm. so I think methodologically, uh, I'm responding to what a lot of researchers say. You know, what is the value of comparing students between races? And there's a lot of other things that are in my dissertation, which I'm willing to share a lot of that which is really looking at race as a construct, right? A report just came out, and I can't remember the name of the organization, and it's called Black is Not a Risk Factor. And we treat race as a line on a survey that we can say, well, being black, you know, reduce your math score by six points. It's like, I can't wake up tomorrow not black, <laughs> right? So I think in being sensitive there, we are thinking about, okay, in the context of self-efficacy, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about like some children getting Beethoven at birth mm -hmm. and some children not even knowing who Beethoven is, right? Mm -hmm. And what does that look like across different communities of students? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about race, it's saying in a racial context, self-efficacy on a theoretical level is the same. On a measurement level, students may respond differently, but we have to think about why. And if you look in, and I'll just take an example of a school that I went with the Harlem. Uh, there's some work that Chris Enden's doing right now. There's some work that Danny Martin and a lot of his students have done. My advisor and I have done this work. And what we found is that in these schools, you know, students are, they might be in a classroom like, I don't want to talk about that question because I'm going to get it wrong. I'm not going to say, you know, that I can answer this question. But then when you sit with them one on one, it's very different. Oh, well, I just didn't want to talk about this because I didn't know that that was right. 
And so self-efficacy may show up in a lot of different ways in different communities, right? Students may not necessarily, so if I measure self-efficacy by do you feel you can answer a math question in class? You know, amongst different populations, they may be like, yeah, I can't. No, I can't, or different students, right? And when we go to the classroom context, what does that look like? And you talk about teacher instruction, right? Mm -hmm. Is the teacher teaching more, I'm the knowledge bearer, you're the knowledge taker? Or is it more collaborative space where students feel empowered that they can? When you think about schools on racial lines, on class lines, right? You see those differences happening, right? Uh, you, you talk about teachers saying a lot about classroom management. And then we automatically say, oh, the students are bad, right? But why do we never say the teacher just doesn't know how to manage the classroom well? You know, really flipping that discussion. And how does that show up when we're talking about achievement and outcomes in math? And I'm not sure if this is, yes, getting No, that. Oh, no, I mean, we're just asking, you know, okay. it's, it's always it's iterative, you know, yeah. I guess I like had four, I went to the tribal schools and I had like four years of self advocacy class, like they had it as a class when I was young. Oh, wow. So I have questions along those lines too, have you talked to students directly about this concept of self advocacy? But I just found that sometimes we think that students are, have a high level of self efficacy, but there's also kind of like, coping mechanisms at play too. Sometimes students have positive self-concepts as a strategy for survival, but they still might be missing really important skills, right? So I'm, I'm just wondering like, if there's any kind of different notions of that concept. I so I think this is where this comes in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is what a lot of quantitative researchers, and this is my, of course, theoretical perspective about the use of large-scale data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people have committed solely to quantitative research as a means to inform things, which is completely fine, right? But I think in terms of how I view these large-scale data sets, it's a response to your question, right? I'm really testing some hypotheses here and saying, in general, when we talk about averages, groups of students, we're, I'm really not talking about context-specific situations, right? This data set is nationally representative, students from all over the nation, but Harlem looks very different than where I currently live in Oakland. And classrooms, I'm in a few different classrooms and I'm just already seeing just the approaches based on, this is the same groups of students, right? Different contexts, different situations, different approaches to education and teaching. So I think a lot of this really means that what we need to do after testing these hypotheses is saying that, okay, in general I found these things to be true and hopefully in the future if I'm doing some more, well, I will be doing some more of this research. I'm referring back to my dissertation to say, you know, I found in my dissertation that this showed up in a nationally representative example, but in this specific context, in this neighborhood, in this school that looks like this, I actually found something different. And this is what self-efficacy looks like. This is what belongingness looks like in this school. And I'm able to talk about that in a more context-specific framework. And I think that's really, where the shift happens and what should happen in terms of this critical research, right? We can't just use quantitative data um, to flatly make these large claims because it's nationally representative. What does that really mean anyway? Can we go back to Angela for a minute? Because I think you know, and from a praxis standpoint, I'm going to push you to kind of think about that in your hands. At her highest level, what does that say about her self's efficacy and or the environment for which she's in? So I'm assuming she's plateauing at one point, mm -hmm. right? So in terms of a, a school um, policy, School. I'm just thinking about your career as a whole. I'm thinking, how do I, um, if, I'm a, if I'm an administrator, if I'm a principal, how do I keep Angela interested? Do I funnel more female students into her mathematics classes, even though female students of color, even though they they may not be proficient at that? You know, how do I kind of keep her engaged? Are you following me? Yes. Um, if these other factors, if peer networking and, and school engagement, and if these other variables are important to her, how do I keep them at a level as she advances 
Yeah. I'm a schoolhouse. Yeah. Okay. So I think first, I would view Angela as a model of success, right? <coughs> Angela's not the ideal student because then we create this other hierarchy, right? We create Angela as this, if you can make a new gap analysis, right? So we want students to be like Angela and not like her. That's not what I think we're doing as much. It's saying, why does Angela have a high school belonging? Why does she have a high, a high school engagement? And if I think about taking this work else, if I find a student like this, this is the cost for a case study, right? Where did her school belongingness come from? What does she say about her classrooms and why she feels she belongs there? Why is her academic career network positively oriented? I may find that it's so positively oriented because she feels like she doesn't really get along with any other students in schools, right? And so there's a lot of nuances that could be in the student that looks on paper, you know, like this model of success. I think it's really zooming in. Now, in response to your second question, how do we keep that high? How do we keep our self-efficacy high? Mm -hmm. I think it's, if I go back to, and I wish I had time, do people have seven minutes? <laughs> huh? you, can I play something for her? Sure. And if you have to leave, okay, thank you for coming back. I want you all, I was going to play this, um, I didn't have as much time. The summer of 1963 was a pivotal period in the civil rights movement. <laughs> Throughout the South, its leaders were working to end segregation. But for every luminary of the movement, there are dozens whose names are lesser known. One of them is Bob Moses, a northerner who organized Mississippi sharecroppers to demand the right to vote. As NPR's Christopher Connolly reports, his work continues today around the country, but now it's in classrooms. The library at Miami Northwestern High School became a mathematics laboratory this summer. Students cluster into small groups. At one table, they're working on polynomials with colorful tubes and blocks. Across the room, they chart parabolas on poster-sized graph paper. So let's just start with uh, how do you construct the axis of symmetry? Bob Moses grew up in Harlem. He's a Harvard-trained philosopher and a veteran teacher. He started this math training program, the Algebra Project, with the MacArthur Genius Grant 30 years ago. Moses is 78 now, but he has the same probing eyes you see behind thick black glasses in photos from 50 years ago when he was a civil rights activist in Mississippi. He expects a lot from these students, but he's gentle with them. We need to get the vocabulary so you can talk it. I need to talk this math. The goal is simple. Take students who score worst on state math tests, double up on the subject for four years, and get them ready to do college-level math by the end of high school. Education is still basically Jim Crow as far as the kids who are in the bottom economic strata of the country. And that makes this work as important as the work he did 50 years ago. So, uh, I lost the slide. I think keeping Angela's self-efficacy high in a, a very like, literal what to do mm -hmm. is ensuring that she's in spaces that in some way, shape, or form look like this or are going to support her. Um, and then in those spaces, going back to her, it's modeling, like, where does she fit in those spaces? Like, what's her role? Because I think Dante in that space can have equally, like, if not even more uh, appropriate role, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's saying, okay, well, you have these two students who are on these math exams, who in these probabilities perform at some level. All right, sure, in terms of demonstrating proficiency, we look at Angela as a model, right? But in terms of Dante, I think we can learn a lot from how he approaches the math what he's doing and thinking about context that will work or will, will be uh, mathematically specific context that will be, um, I think what I'm trying to say is in Angela's frame, there's, there's these things that she has tagged that help her maintain this high self-efficacy. And for Dante, he has a low self-efficacy and I would say that they have not, right? And in this space, I think there's certain behaviors, there's certain actions, there's certain messages that we can send to Dante to help increase his self-efficacy, mm -hmm. which may look very different for Angela. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the point that I'm making is if they're in spaces like this, mm -hmm. and at algebra projects across the country, there's a lot of other, there's a young people's project that there's a lot of, I was working in some schools in Harlem for a lot of years, and it's, it's really context specific, and I can't really get past that word because 
as I do this, this work in a quantitative frame, I do feel that there's this barrier between myself and students, right? Um, and that I'm only able to create these hypothetical situations um, to really investigate further, like what does it mean for him? Because I need to kind of bring her to life. And this is the kind of best I can do with a quantitative study, right? Um, and we, we draw some conclusions here, but I'm, also, I'm almost fearful of doing that in itself because on a, on a theoretical, philosophical level, I'm recreating you know, these differences that you know, in a lot of ways don't really always map to what the reality is or the context they kind of inform. I don't know. How's that? How's that? Okay. Uh, that's, yes. I have a question. It's dealing with Dante. From my um, experience, I worked with a lot of Dantes, uh, with athletes. That, um, now, also, I'm in the South, so mm -hmm. I'm in Florida, where education is a step below compared to like up north and Midwest, where I'm from. What suggestions would you have to kind of build Dante back up from a mentor stand standpoint? I would go back uh, here. So I think Dante has friends, right? We're going, we'll, we'll, let's bring him to life. Um, I think it's starting here at the top, and I know these are blacked out right now. Um, but it's really from a mentor-specific standpoint. Uh, these are questions that you can ask in a lot of different ways, right? You don't literally have to say, Dante, are you a math person? <laughs> um, but I think there's different ways to say, well, understand how Dante views himself as a person, as a mathematical person, right? Um, whether it's in the context of his math classroom. I did a talk um, at, uh, in, 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 in Queens where I was talking to students about uh, mathematics from the bodega to the books, right? And I, I started with, when you get this problem, I gave them a problem on a piece of paper. And it was four items, X, Y, Z. Three items, X, Y, Z. And they had prices in front of them. And it, it was an equation, basically. And I said, can y'all do this? They was like, we haven't learned that yet. And then I said, well, let's go to the bodega. How much is a bag of chips, a juice, and your favorite piece of candy? And they start spitting out. Because one is this and this. I say, how much is that total? And they did the same problem. And I, sh I spent the talk showing, there were sixth graders, showing them that you just did this in a different frame. So I think for us as educators, it's shifting those frames. And it's having the foresight to say, if this problem on the board that looks very mathematical, is the, it's, it causes us stress sometimes, right? How can I shift this and think about this in another context? If I have three variables, what do they do every morning? Kids go to the bodega and get snacks for school and they stick them in their book bag. That is an equation in itself. They're thinking about, do I have enough money? How much is it going to be? And when you use it as like a unit, you know, it's saying, well, how much would this cost over a week? There's some multiplication. What about the month? How much would this be over a year? What if you want to buy something from your friends, right? So for Dante and saying, you know, there's a lot of Dantes, I think mentors, are charged with a lot of the things that I'm looking at. Like the belongingness, the engagement, the performance, the peers. You know, I talk to my mentees and I'm like, you know, well, I'm not sure that person's the best person to be spending a lot of time with right now. Um, and it's really mapping those things for a student like Dante and saying that, reminding him that the messages that we see, right, don't necessarily always show up. And while we're in this space right now, you might not have it performed well beforehand. It's like, what can we do to get you to that space? And sending those positive messages. I, think, I would say, in short, a lot of support. Um, and that support really looks, not necessarily saying you have to go back to provide that support, but it's really just being there. And it's really providing kind of some support to say, that, like, let's push through this. And really say, do you have your notes? Do you have, I've seen some, uh, I've, I've viewed a few different lessons where people that are not able to do math, it's like parents, right? That may not be able to do the level of math their students are currently in. Like, what are strategies at home that you can use to help students when you actually don't know the content, right? It's saying, well, pull out your notes. Let's go through this in a very methodological way, right? What did your teacher say first? What did she say second? And what can you pull from that? Um, secondly, I think it's this last piece, is keep this idea of persistence, right? It's like they're, it's goal orientation. Dante has a specific goal, or any student has a specific goal. It's mapping out how to get there, 
and again supporting them on that trajectory. Um, very high level. Um, yeah. Yeah, because what I run into is um, being a director of admissions at a college and volunteering, helping kids in the inner city about education, how important it is, for, especially working with athletes. They they deal with the testing and. Like you said, you wake up, you might have a bad, bad morning, you take the test. The test that you don't excel on the test. Guiding counselor now saying, whoa, well, well you're, you scored this. I don't think you were, you should look at something else. When it could have been just one instance where this test that they took their freshman year is affecting everything else, their outcome for their life. So it's trying to just come up with other avenues and you know, opportunities to kind of show them that, you know, this is possible because a lot of kids you hear, well, I want to be in business. Business statistics. I mean, there's business math. There's a lot of different things. So when I throw that out there to them, all of a sudden they shift their mind to, well, I might want to be a cop or a social, <laughs> something where they don't have to deal with the math portion. And I'm just been trying to get as much information, gather information to, kind of work on changing his perception. Because the South is, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. So you're looking at maybe a decade, two decades behind, and the mindset in the inner city, yeah. So there's a lot of organizations uh, doing, if you send me an email, I think it's, um, they have work in workshops. They also have st like lessons online. There's this book called Social Justice by the Numbers. Um, and this book talks specifically to what you're saying, right? All right, statistics looks like in a textbook, in a standard textbook this way, but if you think about it, you know, one of the lessons in the book is how do you create its access, like a, a wheelchair ramp to get students up. And there, you looking at triangles, and you know, when you think about a wheelchair ramp, you know, there's a path here, right? So a student may say that they have a, a family member in a wheelchair, there's the engagement piece. Well, how would you get them up this ramp or into school? Because we don't have stairs here, right? And we think about that, you got the Pythagorean theorem, right? We have A, B, and C. And it's showing them that, like, this is not what you see on a test. Because the test says that A is this, B is this, find C. It's like, this is, this is real. This is where the sidewalk is. This is where we're standing right now. And as students that don't necessarily have the highest mass self efficacy see more of these examples, it's like, oh, it's not just A squared plus B squared plus C squared. This is what it means in a mathematical context in the real world. And as they see more of these, when you say this is statistics, they can talk about like, well, what are your five, faith, uh, what are your five favorite football players right. or basketball players? Bring up those statistics from there, right? And say, well, all right, so who's, who's the best running back this season? Who's the best running back last season? And you know, those are all statistics that they look at, right? Be on ESPN. I think there's some teachers, I don't know any personally, but using you know, uh, fantasy football and a lot of these other tools that people use every day to teach their students so that when they talk about statistics, it's like, well, this is what statistics really looks like after high school, right? It's not just regressing the line or solving for the answer. Yeah. I like what she said. It's making you think outside of the box, and when you're dealing with inner city, a lot, unfortunately, especially where I'm at, they don't think outside of the box. It's just very a, you know, a equals x or whatever. Yeah. And there's nothing where it's challenging them to think outside of the box, so they can remember these concepts as time goes on. So, and it's engaging. There's that engagement, yeah. right? I want to comment on what. You just asked and what you responded. <laughs> There's a big push right now in math for something called mathematical modeling, which I'm really tired of hearing about and talking about, but I think you're showing the importance of mathematical modeling. Mathematical modeling is mathematizing real world situations. So taking a real world situation, figuring out what math you need to use to solve that problem, trying to solve it and then bringing the math back to the real world to see, does the solution I came up with make sense? Does it work? Does it really address the problem? And if you can get teachers to come up with modeling activities 
that are in a context for students that are interesting and engaging, I think that's one way that can really bring students into math. When it's just a bunch of letters and numbers on the board, it's really a turnoff for a lot of people, which I totally understand. So, I, I mean, I feel we talk about it ad nauseum in our department, yes. but something like this makes me understand why it is really important, because students, students need to be engaged and variables on a board are just not engaging unless you're super nerd, but most, most kids aren't. Um, so I think, I think part of the outcomes of a study like this is going to be how can we now change teachers, because teachers are not the easiest people to change. Um, but a lot of times the methods that they're using don't work for all students, and how do you change a teacher's framework from well, it works for most students, so I'm going to keep doing it to what can I do to reach these students who I'm not currently reaching. So I think, I think that's going to be an outcome that's really challenging but also really important. And it's interesting because my focus is early childhood, but a lot of the themes in this study are really pervasive in early childhood in general. The teachers have really low self-efficacy with math when they're in early childhood. And then they're just turned off, and they don't engage. And they say from the beginning, I can't do it. And then those attitudes carry over into the classroom. We, so, we in the see in our department, we take a lot of math do. courses through our program, mm -hmm. just pure math classes. And I have Deanna and Nicole here. And we see it, right? A lot. A lot. Nicole's at the board. I'm sitting in my seat. Where are you at, Deanna? <laughs> <laughs> we would be in the front seat and we see this even in a graduate school context, right? Like self-efficacy showing up, where it's like, can I really do this? Am I going to pass? I experienced it myself, too. The beginning of the program, I just felt it was all really over my head. And as I became more confident, I was, I was doing better. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but I think... I think Studying more math helps me to get more confident, but I think getting more confident helped me to do better in the math. So um, I think self-efficacy is just a really important issue to address in lots of different communities, yeah. but here, here as well, I think it's really important. It definitely is important to start early. From, from the studies I've had, if we can get them like the, starting at the sixth grade, knowing how important this portion is, <laughs> Right, well, I, and the reason why I, I used to think, well, it should be easy, but I had to look at my situation where my dad was an engineer, so he was a mechanical engineer, worked at General Motors, so my house, I already knew that portion, and just being the nerd athlete, thinking this is how things should be, but as I got older and I started investing back into the community, into the schools, and mentoring and tutoring, uh, kids in the urban area, you start seeing that their structure at home is not like that, where they have, where math is important, because math is, math rules the world, pretty much. You can't do anything from, you know, Wall Street to um, just, and you know, them. yeah, everything is dealing with math, and trying to get kids to do that and understand how important it is, it's been a challenge, because you're going against so many different people from guys, counselors, teachers, early te early education teachers, and then their parents. So it, you bumping heads a lot. And I, I, I was gonna say just one little comment from why this is a study of black students, right? And I didn't talk as much about this in my um, presentation today, but in my dissertation I make an argument looking at a lot of people that look at school, and school segregation in the, the modern-day framework, mm -hmm. which basically says, if we're going to take this research down a classroom context, right? Those classrooms, there's a study that says at some point after like 85 or 86 percent, you know, the likelihood of the school just being all black or all one race, you know, it's, it's there, right? And we see that in our schools, right? And it's thinking, I can spend time comparing students across groups, but Thinking about models of success, I think it's debunking the fact that in our schools, in our lower performing schools, when people tag that thing, right, in our schools that are not doing well, there are still students who are quantitatively literate, who are, as you describe yourselves, like this nerd athlete, right, 
and they're there. And if we can get teachers and administrators to think about these contexts versus saying, well, this is my assessment score for you know this year. Nobody did well. And then those two students that did well are become exceptions to the rule versus models for them to say, well, they're in the same school, same classroom, same cafeteria, same neighborhoods likely, right? We can learn a lot from these students in terms of them not just being exceptions. And we, we make excuses, and I see teachers and even myself sometimes making excuses and say, oh, they're doing well because, right? What is that really saying about the other students, right? You know, when you make students exceptions to the rule that they're there. Right? They put you in a box. You're, oh, I just want to say officially thank you. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Always respect your work. I, I, I can have tons of conversations with you beyond this. Um, thank you.